Our next guest runs one of the world's beverage giants, giving him an inside look at the consumer and at inflation. We want to welcome Coca-Cola CEO James Quincy. And James, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Great to be back. Uh, we have so much to talk about, but let's start with those points. Just w what's happened with inflation, where things have headed. Um, Consumers have been willing to pay up for quite a while. You took the price hikes when you needed to to deal with the inflation, the higher costs that you were dealing with. But you consciously chose to step back from that. How are things going right now? Things are good. I think you're seeing a little divergence in the inflation story. Um, what I mean by that is the main kind of developed economies is moderating substantially, both on the input side and in the marketplace. Um, and it's kind of coming down in expectations uh, towards the landing zone. Uh, that's much more normal, and we'll be back to our core strategy, uh, which is earning the right to take price without marketing and innovation. And on the two kind of extremes of the thing, you've still got a number, given we operate everywhere, of very high inflation countries that are not really uh, getting better. Um, and there are some countries where inflation is arguably too low, uh, and they're kind of borderline, need a bit more inflation. But the main story uh, is moderating inflation, coming into the landing zone, uh, back to the classic... Uh, story of earning the right for pricing. There has been this uh, big story that's blown up between your competitor Pepsi and Carrefour um, where they said, forget it, we're not going to put any Pepsi products on our shelves anymore because we don't like the price hikes that have come through. What do you deal with with suppliers? Have you had any of those same kind of pushbacks or issues? We, when we deal with our own suppliers, we have a, we have a very long-standing approach, which is to go for very long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. um, so we like, given our size, we like to get long-term security of supply. That's our number one problem is getting enough. Uh, we get long-term pricing agreements, uh, and then we layer on hedging. So we very much smooth out the cycle. So we, have, we don't tend to go up very quickly, and we don't tend to crash back down. And we like the idea of seeing the cycle through. It really helps us stabilize our business. Uh, which is why we're not so spiky on, on pricing. And, and it's a deliberate approach. And as a result, you have not dealt with any of these same sort of situations? Uh, of course. In, I mean, in different countries, in different environments, there can be a, a more or less friction uh, with some of our retail partners. But in the end, we come back uh, to our strategy, which is to earn the right to the pricing. Uh, and, our, and our story to retail is, is we can grow the beverage business faster than their total business. And we given our leadership and our innovation market, will grow faster within that. And that's a positive story for them. It, it's, they need their economics to work too. I, I love how you are using artificial intelligence, even with your innovation too. Can you explain to people how you are, how you are using it, even when it comes to new tastes and flavors? Yeah, I, I think it all falls in the bucket of seeing how, what sort of cool stuff you can do in 2023. Uh, come on to 2024. We've, we've used artificial intelligence to design a a Coke drink, a Coke variant. We, we had a, a program called Coke Creations, still have a program called Coke Creations, which is about made, making flavors that people could engage with, whether it was from space or also Marshmallow the DJ. You thought it was a food, right. no, it was a DJ. And then artificial intelligence designed a version, which was, which was cool and very engaging for people. I think the challenge now, uh, as we take those sort of applications of drinks and we had a program at Christmas where you could make a Coke Christmas card with AI. You could tell it what you wanted to be in the picture and it would make a Christmas card for you. And we put them up on Times Square, thousands of them. Next year, this year, 2024, it's about can we turn cool ideas into ideas at scale? Can this generative AI really operate at massive scale? I think that's the next In point terms here. of creating actual drinks? And the question I was going to ask is are those drinks so much fundamentally different than something that you know, your team would come up with in a, in a room? They were different. Um, I'm they not were... sure they're fundamentally different. Right. They, they were engaging and it was a bit of fun. Uh, I think that generative AI needs to demonstrate that it can operate at scale because it, it could make a profound difference in the marketing industry um, as it moves. But from... more on marketing than on coming up with the next drink and flavor uh, profile yes. that no one ever thought of, but somehow the AI figured out. Never say never, but I think it's much more likely to be the marketing than the drinks. Because you trust your gut when it comes to the actual product? No, I just think there's less room. I mean, there's more creativity possible when you're creating an image or a story or, right. or text than there is on a, a, on a physical taste profile. Uh, variants tend to be James, nuanced. Given all, watching the, over the years, we own bottlers, we don't own bottlers, we got shelf space, we don't. Can't you use AI just to absolutely maximize the profit from logistically on, on how everything operates? Can't you, isn't it a more effective way to do that or... Absolutely. It's possible. Yeah. Absolutely. As you start to get more compute power and more data 
available. Lots of companies, including ourselves, including big tech companies, right. they have data in different pockets that are not talking to each other. But with these overlays that take all the dirty data sources that are not standardized, you can now start to layer on really good predictive uh, predictive something that works out from the consumer back what everything should be in the supply chain. So that optimization is coming and is a big piece of what needs. We what see about, it affect. Uh -huh. I got it. We got it. I have to have a very selfish question. James knows. I, don't even know I am is. addicted, addicted. I'm an addict of AHA, which is his flavored uh, seltzer water, for, for lack of a better uh, word. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, bubbly water, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And they were competing uh, against bubbly on, on, on the PepsiCo side. And all the other folks that are now doing sparkling water. Poland Springs. I love the aha, the the orange grapefruit. Yes, you, you say did. it's a tough business, the sparkling water business. I thought the, it would be the greatest, highest margin business you could have because what is it? It's just it's just the water sparkled up a little bit. They, they have. The, there are some consumers like yourself that love it. Unfortunately, but there's not enough of us. And and it's a very competitive industry. Uh huh. Um, it's, uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So what? So what's supposed to happen here? Um, we're we're going to keep trying. We're going to okay. keep reinventing. Uh, we've pushed more uh, into our Topo Chico flavored right. uh, uh, waters, uh, bringing some flavor in there. So we will keep innovating. Our, our modus operandi is not to give up on the first attempt, but to keep iterating and find the space that works for us.